Good evening and welcome to Artist Talk on Art. It's May 1st, 2023. I'm Doug Shear, president of ATOA. Tonight, we're featuring a dialogue between Mongolian artist Zaya Saikan Sambu uh, as he is being interviewed by the author and art historian, Dr. Gail Levin. We record this copyrighted Zoom event and then post it to our YouTube channel with usually within a week. All rights are reserved. Ultimately, the same recording will become part of the massive ATOA archive at Archives of American Art of the Smithsonian Institution. Hi. Founded in 1974, yeah, ATO ATOA has been heralded as the art world's longest running and we would say most productive talk series, having produced over a thousand panels and dialogues featuring more than 8,500 artists. Dr. Levin will see your questions or comments in the Zoom's chat function at the bottom of your screen and hers, and later in the program, address them to Zaya. Make note, next week, Monday, May 8th, we will feature an interview by me of a longtime friend and colleague, the pho photography critic and syndicated correspondent and many times book author, Alan Coleman, also known as A.D. Coleman. Don't miss that. Gail Levin is Distinguished Professor of Art History, American Studies and Women's Studies at the Graduate Center and Baruch College of the City University of New York. The acknowledged authority on the American realist painter, Edward Hopper, she is author of many books and articles on this artist, including the Catalogue Resonne and Edward Hopper, an intimate biography. Her work on 20th century and contemporary art has won international acclaim, been widely published and translated in Europe, Asia, and Australia. Articles range from theory of artist biographies to explorations of the intersection of American and Asian cultural studies. She has also focused on the art of Jewish women artists in a historical context. Her interest in women artists led to biographies of Judy Chicago in 2007 and 2018 uh, and of Lee Krasner in 2011 and 2019. Her project, Teresa Bernstein, A Century in Art, included a book in 2013, a comprehensive website, and a touring exhibition. It was the product of her collaboration with several scholars, including her doctoral students at the Graduate Center. Gail Levin is not only a curator, but also shows her own work as an artist and photographer. In her Hopper's Places, 1985 and again in 1998, and Marsden Hartley in Bavaria, 1989, she found and identified the artworks and exact places they depicted. She then photographed and analyzed how the painters transformed the scenes. These projects, which resulted in both books and exhibitions, she considers conceptual art, thinking along lines sketched by Saul Lewitt. <clears throat> Quote, in conceptual art, the idea or concept is the most important aspect of the work. When an artist uses a conceptual form of art, it means that all of the planning and decisions are made beforehand and the execution is a perfunctory affair. The idea becomes a machine that makes the art, end quote. That's from Saul Lewitt, Paragraphs on Conceptual Art, which appeared in Art Forum in June of 1967. As has happened with Lewitt's wall drawings, others have emulated Levin's photographs of Hopper's scenes. After research into the lives of other artists, Levin has produced a, a collage memoir that brings a singular perspective to her own life in art. Even while active as an art historian and curator, she was producing photographs, collages, paintings, and prints. Her collage memoir on not becoming an artist, a retrospective, 
begins with her earliest self-portrait and then shows and tells her story of growing up in the Deep South, where her parents threatened to disown her if she became an artist. Successive collages trace her journey into the worlds of museums and art history, exploring the sometimes blurred lines between art, art history, and criticism. Gail. Doug, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? It's okay? Yes. Pleasure to be here tonight um, with my friend uh, Zaya, who's uh, just arrived from Mongolia a few days ago. I'll um, preface this with we met um, in the summer of 2019. I was a Fulbright scholar in Mongolia, thanks to one of my Baruch undergraduates who graduated and is now at the Kortel, um, Duka Amrasekhan. And uh, suddenly I got word from Fulbright, I was on their roster, that I was going to Mongolia. And it was three or four years after Duca, my student, had graduated and I hadn't heard from her. She knew I wanted to come, but I was quite um, astonished and delighted that she arranged it. And it's she who took me to meet Zaya in his studio. And um, maybe I'll comment when we get to the painting that um, I saw there that first um, grabbed my imagination. But um, during the pandemic, one of the last visitors I had was Zaya in February 2020, who arrived from Mongolia and wanted to discuss my writing a book about him. And that became uh, my pandemic project that I could do uh, while isolating in my home um, and teaching online uh, during this dreadful pandemic. But it's one of the bright moments for me really kept me focused. So it's a great pleasure to bring to this audience um, Zaya and something of Mongolian culture. And um, let's see, I'm gonna try to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint and, um, oh, I want to introduce Zaya, of course. Um, he's right here. He's born in a small town in the Gobi Desert, he'll tell you the name of it, Batsagam, I believe, um, 1975. His father was a painter, and uh, so he absorbed it early on. He um, grew up under the wrath of the communists, uh, who were very against religion, and of course, Mongolians were Buddhists. And he got very curious looking at Buddhist art images, and I, at one point, I, I know he told me he was on his way to summer camp and he got out of the, the group car and ran off to the last remaining um, Buddhist monastery and asked the monk there if he could apprentice, and he did. Um, he's uh, moved on from that, but he is um, married to a beautiful Japanese woman, they live in the capital of Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, but he has lived in Japan and they have four children together. Um, and Zaya has shown, my goodness, in many places, not only in the United States, although his first one person show is opening Thursday, this Thursday, is in March, May 4th at Thomas Jekyll, um, Gallery, I want to get the full name of the gallery? It's Thomas Jekyll Gallery. Yeah, in Chelsea. Chelsea. And um, we what's hope the, you'll What's the people. address, Gail, the address of the gallery? Um, do you have the, the exact five, address? I think it's 526 Thomas Jekyll Gallery in the 20, West 25th Street. 25th Street. Yeah, 25th yeah. Street. West 25th Street. Street. Thomas is on, so he could put the... Um, address in the chat for us. But I also have the poster for the gallery. It's going to show up on my PowerPoint. Um, and um, that's it. I'm going to show some of the work from the show and some older work. And I'm going to give a brief introduction um, about um, Mongolian um, art. 
Now let me make sure I get. Uh, mm. I, I, it, it's actually five uh, three two West Twenty Fifth Street. Five three two West Twenty Fifth Street, and it's between six and eight this Thursday, and everybody's invited to drop by. You'll have a delight, I'm sure. I'll be there. Um, let's see. There we go. Can you see this now? Um, so that's the book, Mongolia Lost and Found. And it coincided with the shows I had at the National Gallery in Ulaanbaatar, the um, capital of Mongolia. And Zaya, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you, and uh, I'm so excited to having my uh, first solo show in New York. And uh, I'm also thanks for Gail. You're welcome. Let's for everything, <laughs> what you did. Here is um, the the poster from Thomas Jekyll's gallery, the solo show, May fourth to June seventeen. Um, it's Zaya's first one-person show at a New York gallery. He has shown on the West Coast. I started to say he's shown in Japan. Um, he's been in group shows in various places like India, Britain. I think he's shown in France, Germany. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving off some, but you get the idea. He's shown. And one of the show is called Mothers of Invention. He loves to paint women. I would say um, he paints heroic Mongolian women. And he, he's very into music, all kinds of music. And um, he listens to music when he's painting. And if we have time, I think we might have a, a little recording of Mongolian music. But he listens to all kind of American music, every kind of pop music you can think of. Do you want to comment about this first image on the right? And What's happened to its life? Uh, it's, <clears throat> actually, this is uh, after 12 years I lived in Japan and moved to 2019 to Mongolia. And. Uh, oh, so you came back just as I arrived? Yeah. yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, um, yeah, the Mongolia, since when I was a ch uh, childhood time and a teenager time, and uh, when I was a student, and I've been not lived there for 17 years. After 17 years, I moved back to Mongolia. The things change a lot, good way, bad way. And uh, anyway, so as an artist, uh, I have some critical thoughts about society. And we are so busy to, you know, to be in the capitalism. Everybody wants to be rich. Everybody wants to be survived. But then there is something they're missing, which most important thing is a more, you know, historical valuable things which our ancestors left for us, and there's so much denying for that. You know, nobody cares seems to be. And uh, in front of my studio, there was uh, one dark uh, wooden house. Was there? That was uh, actually a museum dedicated for political victims which is 1939 and socially, when socialism come after the Stalin's order, they killed over 40,000 people, including with the 20,000 monks. So that museum was there in front of my uh, studio, but the one day they just smashed it and broken the whole museum and they start to build the big tower. And I feel so sad. And, and then that's what this painting idea comes. It's actually, I carefully study the victims of family and Mongolian royal family, uh, some uh, smart people. Who, Inter intellectuals. Who, yeah, intellectual peoples. And then I study carefully historical figures and then it's bring up in, you know, try to help them to meet our generations. And that's what this uh, painting stands. Uh, the, the whole content was like that. So if I can just comment, if everybody understood that it was Stalin yeah. from Russia um, with Mongolian collaborators who 
massacred uh, is it 40,000 Mongolians? Yeah, it's unofficially they say 40 to 50,000 people, but the, there is an official count is at least 20,000 monks. And almost all the yeah. Buddhist monasteries were yes, destroyed. In, uh, yes, including with the royal family, but including with the most intellectual people and who loves Mongolia, who, who built Mongolia, then genocide the whole family. Mm. So it, it has unfortunate parallels with Russian aggression now in Ukraine. Oops. Okay. So just to remind everybody, here's Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolian green. Yeah. How do you characterize Mongolia geographically? Yeah, geographically, you know, we're between uh, Russia and China. It's, uh, we don't have a sea access and uh, it's a very, you know, it's a Central Asia, I would say, I like to say like, let's put it this way, you know, we are compared to a hamburger or sandwich, we are meat between two big bread. So everybody loves meat, right? So that's what, to me, is Mongolia is the most exotic country. And China and Russia put the squeeze on the meat. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, I like to put that way in a way. Okay. And I just want to mention the trade routes and uh, the way Buddhism spread from India um, across China and across the top of Mongolia. And Mongolian Buddhism is closest to Tibetan Buddhism, correct? Yeah, it's a, we actually uh, take the religion, uh, I think it's the 16th century, we inherited from Tibet. Uh, it's a kind of same, it's Tibet, but it's a little different, you know, Mongolia used to be have more shaman, they have more sh shamanism. Sham shamanism, but the, the Buddhism come to Mongolia, they don't really accept firstly, and then it's a little bit mixed with the shaman, it's a change, but it's still Buddhism. So this is just some earlier examples of Buddhist art, I'm not gonna read all this, this slide from my teaching, but this, um, this uh, Tara, um, Zai, you wanna comment on who the Tara is? And... Oh yeah, this is actually, uh, I was into painting, there's a few other uh, reason and uh, inspirations. So one of my uh, biggest inspiration was uh, Zan Bazar, it's a uh, Mong consider is a Mong Mongolian Michelangelo. So uh, he was a religious leader in the 16th century and he was a, a painter, he was a sculpture artist. And he do many things. And uh, one unique thing about his work is he is a kind of humanized the traditional Buddhist gods into human figures, more make close to him. He actually break tradition, and that's what you know. To me, is it was so exotic, and I start to know when I was fourteen. Zanozer, I was even dreaming I want to be like a second Zanozer. <laughs> that's like biggest dream to me anyway. So that's what you know. Green Tara is very very important to me. There's a in white Tara. There's a 21, 21 Tara. He created that masterpieces in Mongolian history or art. And who did this one? This is actually my image. And I mean, I painted when I was, I think I believe in 13 or 14. And uh, I, uh, I interacted with the uh, painting through religious figures, which is, you know, copying Taras and copying Buddhas and, and doing my, uh, you time, uh, you know, the socialism clubs and uh, uh, people rest restore the religion and faith. And uh, Buddhism was so exotic. And that's what to me was, it's, it's so new. And as a teenager, you learned Buddhist chants at the monastery, right? Yes, uh, that's a long story in a way. Uh, uh, I, as Gail said, I was grow up in a little small town. There's only maybe about a hundred household. Almost everybody is my uh, relative. 
And it's in a Gobi Desert. For teenager, for active boy, it's so bore, boring place. Mostly I bored. But then also I was a troublemaker. I make troubles. I always look for some excitement. And then my mother punished me many, many times, but I never give up. But then in my town, there was one small wooden house, which is look like a monastery. But then always people say there is like ghost living there. Nobody lives there. It's always locked. Then any, anytime when I make a trouble, my mom always make me scared. You know, if you make a trouble, we will lock you in that ghost house. So there was a one huge storm happened that time. And then in the one day in the morning, I saw shocking thing. The house is broken down. Then I, I'm so much curious what was inside. And I go there and I check it out what's going on. Then I found some beautiful hand drawing Buddhist God images and beautiful writings, old scripts I found. And some of them broken, some of them actually, it's in a good condition. So I collect them and I start to making copies of that, those images. That's what I was very first time to begin to paint uh, Taras and try to study the Tibetan sculptures and stuff like that. And this though is your most recent um, yeah. Buddhist painting, which was a commission. Yes, uh, this right before come to New York, I got uh, a private commission from some businesswoman, and uh, he, he, she likes me to illustrate the Zanbazar's uh, portrait, but then without 21 Tara, yeah, Zanbazar is to me is not so much interested, I thought, so then I illustrated this piece. With the 21 Tara. 21 Tara. The but female gods. Female gods, that's actually, there's a two common Tara, it's one green Tara, one white Tara. The green Tara represented its mother figure, you know, for whoever, who has a children, usually they believe in that Tara. The white Tara is represented, it's a teenager's uh, God, which is, you know, it's a representative uh, kind of virginity and pure mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it's 21, this Tara, is a, this green Tara has 21 different faces. Um, by the way, one of the things my um, former student, uh, well, first of all, I was based at this museum, the Zanabazar Art Museum, which is very important in Ulaanbaatar. She was working there. But when she was taking my art market course, she was tracing art that might have been stolen from Mongolia that lacked good provenance. Because between the Chinese and uh, others, people, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, looting, shall we say, there has been. So. Now, this is one of the treasures actually of the Zanabazar Museum, Art Museum, and it's Marzen Sharov's A Day in Mongolia. This is only one detail of um, a huge painting um, from the very early 20th century, and it it shows secular national themes, daily life in Mongolia, and it's painted on um, with mir mineral paint on cotton, like a Tibetan tanka or a Mongolian tanka, Buddhist tanka. Yeah. So you want to talk about? Tell us about. Um, so this is not socialist realism, yeah. and it's not a Buddhist tanka, but it's. It's sort of early modern Mongolian art. Yeah, it's a late uh, 18th century to beginning on uh, 19th century Mongolia, one of the most famous 20th, 20th, 20th century. Yeah, yeah. late so, 19th, yeah, early 20th. Yeah. 19 to 20. Yes, it's the one of the most famous uh, historical uh, uh, painter artist, and uh, it's a uh, he's known by Martin. Martin means. Uh, uh, funny and uh, how do you say humorous, it? humorous and the face. It's, 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 a lot of wit. Yes, a lot of wit. 
he's uh, such a, uh, you if know. If we show them in detail, you can yeah. probably comment more yeah. easily why that is. Yeah. What's going on um, in this picture, in this detail? Yeah, I mean, we can. Uh, there's a lot of things we can talk about. Uh, Mar Mar everybody Shana. knows the yeah, year, yeah, yeah, yes. special Mongolian tin. Yeah, but then when the, it's by composition, you know, he took the painting, it's like a bird eye viewpoint. And that is like the nomadic people's, you know, mentality. They want to see things from up mm -hmm. and they want to see the whole thing. And then another reason is, you know, we've been constantly moving around, constantly dealing with the difficult weather and nature. And also, plus we carry a lot of animals and we don't have a, like, you know, such a library or such a storage, such a big city. Mongolians yes. have a real nomadic yeah, yeah. tradition. So once you have a flat canvas, and he, the artist wants to share everything once. So that's what this is a great storytelling painting, including to birth to that, that the whole human life story. You know, there is a marriage, there is a, you know, making laws, there is a, you know, the woman having birth and there is even a little bubble happening. There's all kinds of life events. So this great storytelling. Also, life is not just you know recording the events or documentary. And he shares such a great sense of humor, funny way. It's a fun. And then you can see right here, uh, two person making love behind a camel, and up there is a camel also making love. There's there is a busy life happening. You know, taking care of the camel, taking the wools, or wools from ca uh, camel and making, how you say, the youth canvas or wool uh, stuff. Weaving. Like, yeah. And then, yeah, there's a bunch of things happening. It, it needs to hour and day to read this painting. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks like a book. So it's, it's called Zurek. Yeah, Zurek, yeah. Um, did you discover it in art school? I actually discovered it from book when I was in, uh, in the Gobi District in elementary school, but then when I come to college and I study more. So it's, 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 it's definitely a unique piece, only can come from nomadic people's lifestyle. But you did go to art school. Talk about that a little bit. I went to different kind of school, and my first school was a private art college and I studied traditional Mongolian painting. Then I went to University of Art of Mongolia and spent about four years to study art history and also traditional Mongolian painting. I remember, I think you told me a story that you had a friend who would sell your art to tourists when you were a student. Is that right? Well, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, my, uh, uh, that's like beginning of the 90s. We, uh, when we come from country, can you imagine country, from countryside to little boy come to become a student? And uh, that time was uh, the whole society was kind of trans transition between different uh, socialism to capitalism. And uh, it's, it's kind of rush and uh, uh, very, I would say it's very poor time and nobody buys painting. So students try to make copy of uh, Marzan Sharov's painting and try to sell tourists. So I was like one of them and, and, and begging to sell our painting for like uh, $1 to five bucks. <laughs> yeah, that's a great memory. So this is a more recent painting. Yeah, it's, I did in 2020. It's uh, actually, I painted this painting and I showed to give with the internet and uh, it was uh, hard to give a name. In a way, it's a, she, she actually gave to name to this painting. It's called Shape of Sound. It, it reminded me of Vasily Kandinsky and uh, the color triangles. He even wrote a, a play called The Yellow Sound and he talked about blue triangle being heavenly and it made me think of that but this painting has undergone an evolution talk about what happened oh yeah, yeah. Uh, why did you 
Well, during that, that uh, 2020, that time was no war. I mean, I thought, you know, these are actually represent the mother figures. It's, it's, it's actually, I'm creating my own Tara. So the mothers always stand for their own kids for, you know, unconditionally, whatever. They, you know, they're ready to protect, they're ready for war. But then it was, this painting was in my studio for two years. And uh, last year, when, uh, you know, Russia, Ukrainian war started, and I feel so sad and I feel so bad. I, I just don't want, don't want to see the guns in my painting. And I take it out the guns and that's what happened. This is actually retouched the piece in the last, last year. So that's really a mark of history on this painting. Makes me think of yeah. um, Edward Hopper painted out um, a laxative on his sign, and, yeah. but later put it back in. They yeah. buyer asked him to put it back. You can see when you see the second person's eye has a kind of badge. Oh, what's that badge? That badge is actually in the, during socialist time. I now mean, still they're doing the tradition. It, it's you know, the government wants to support the, the population to grow, and then when you have four children. You got a word for a second, you know, it's glorious mom. Uh -huh. You're the glorious mom. Then you have more than seven or six children, you got you can get the number one. So that's what that's what happened. This to me is it's it's it, it, uh, when I go back to Mongolia 17 years ago, I seen in the market, I seen it everywhere people selling, but my mom has like one or two, and it's just precious memory, even you know. Socialism, but still, it's people living there, you know. And there's a bunch of sacrifice. It's a lot of story, a lot of things that paid for get that hour, you know. So it's precious memory. It's become sometimes useless, and then mm -hmm. I collect them, and then I use this like a collage way on my uh, very recent paintings. Yes, you've covered some images. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I created even. Giant huge book that is covered by 3,000 pieces or badges during that area. Now, these women are going to be in the show that's opening on Thursday. Yes. And you tell me this is giving Mongolian identity to American pop art, adding to the, the legacy of American pop art. Yes, I mean, I'm an exploring or experimenting the pop art. Uh, Emit uh, pop art colors and styles into Mongolian identity, and uh, uh, that's to me is interested. I uh, I enjoy to making these pieces, and they have also a little bit of stories and you about them, identity. Yes, you call them candy girls. What did you call them? Then? The candy girls. Well, to be honest with you, I candy girl is a very popular name. It's also popular culture. And it's easy to understand, you know, it's just easy to welcome me to Mongolian identity. That's what I'm borrowing that name. Mm. And so yeah. So that's pop Mongolian culture. No, I mean, not, I, would, I, I wouldn't say like that because Mongolia has not really popular culture except nomadic culture. So mm. if you see, if, if you want to see like, okay, you want to see Mongolian pop art. That could be not candy girls, that could be horses. Because mm. everybody loves horse, every kid draw a horse, every painter paint a horse. Even in Mongolia, most rich artists painting all the time horses. So, so when I see five skulls, yeah. my first thought is about death, but you told me um, that these skulls, you Explain to me okay. that the skulls come yep. from, did you talk about this? Okay, yeah, yeah, this is, well, I personally like the story of the Tibetan skeleton to dancing these two images, but, but also Mongolians also adapted that to even recreate the most beautiful way. But then in, uh, Okay, let me tell you this story. There was a long time ago, um, two 
couple who stole things from people. I mean, thief, yeah? mm -hmm. thieves, yeah. thieves, thieves. And then they actually dead and their spirit went to heaven in a meeting with the Buddha. So they think they are good people. They want to go to heaven, but then Buddha is not allowed to enter heaven. So their condition is basically go to hell. They are rejected. Yeah, they rejected. But yeah. then they are begging to Buddha so to fix their mistakes. And then Buddha give them one chance. Okay, you go back. You go back to earth. You go you take, life, take the life. And then what you get from people, you can pay back it. You what want, they took, they you, can pay yeah, back. Yeah, pay back. Then once you finish the uh, challenge, then you can come back. Then actually Buddha was forgetting many, many years later, two skeletons knock Buddha's door. They was very happy and dancing to meet the Buddha. And then even Buddha asked them, who are you? And then that's the two deep couple. And they said, oh, we paid everything. We even give our blood and whatever they have. And we have only bones left. Then that's what the story is called, Durtu uh, Daug. So this is inspires me. And then in a, in a Buddhist mythology in Mongolia, I hear this story. Uh, when you have a skeleton, when death comes to you, they see the skeleton, you, they thought you're already dead and not taking your life. And then, so a skeleton cheats dead. A skeleton is, becomes protection. Protection, yeah. So that's what, you know, it, it, it's uh, like, that's what this piece is called, magic head. And then the other figure, uh, which is this guy who wearing a uh, mask, this is actually one of the uh, Buddhist biggest celebration we call uh, Tama Thanks. It's a thousands of God coming down to earth and we celebrate, you know, the dance. That's what, the, this is actually the dance. Somebody had conduct all these gods. And then uh, this is the guy who conduct her. And then this actually woman or girl shouldn't be wearing his head. And my, my candy girls are actually wearing that hat and I like to call them as a, you know, magic hat. So they're very protected. They're very protected. They're, they're <laughs> and didn't you tell me that motorcycle gangs with black oh, leather yeah. jackets yeah. and skulls yeah, yeah, yeah. are wearing them for protection? Yeah, yeah, this is like, I can see even in the Western uh, culture, uh, the heavy metal rock bands and uh, bikers, they decorated their dress with the skeletons, a bunch of skeletons. I think they know the, the handle, you know, concept behind all that skeleton. They're, they're dangerous. They're doing always risky stuff and they could be die any moment sometime. So probably. And you listened to heavy metal music at one point, didn't you? Yeah, I was a teenager. When I was a teenager, I, I, I fell in love with the heavy metal music. I started. Um, Remember how you got some of your early Western music? Yeah, um, that's, uh, you know, during beginning of 90s in, in the Mongolians opened up the borders and everybody is, you know, selling something, you know. My uh, brother collects the marmot skins and then he sells marmot skin to Russians. He always go to Russia and make some money and come back. So whenever he come back, he brings some cassette tapes. That's what I met with the Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd. Yeah, right? that's what I was all in love with Pink Floyd. I don't know what they're singing. It seems to be everything is to me. It's like they're talking deep life. You know, that's what I met with most of uh, American heavy metal, uh, classic rock. How did you play the cassettes when you didn't have electricity on it? Well, we, you know, uh, we don't have electricity in Top Town, but then in, anyway, so. Some people uh, come to town to sell many things and they also sell battery. So <laughs> battery is a very important thing. So I just want to, to point listen, out. listen music. So that's why there's a boom box there. Yes, it's yes. a battery. Yes. Okay. Now what's going, this is a much earlier image. You're only 14 or 15. Yeah, it's- Life and death. 
yeah, I, you know, in a little town, we always hear some stories. And uh, there was, uh, in my town, there was a long time ago, there was a Mongolian, very, you know, uh, famous by a wrestler, wrestling. And it, even some of wrestlers, they actually descended from Mongolia too. And Mongolia, wrestling is the biggest culture. But there was in my town, there was one guy, great wrestler who has a big body. You know, he's tall and he has a big chest. And he died. And then he died. And then that time, uh, they usually offer the body for the nature. They don't do, you know, underground, like symmetry. So it's like for the Yeah, monsters. yes. And then a year later, somebody accidentally see weird thing, which is wood give a birth inside of his chest. He makes home. So I hear that story and I thought that's a interesting because that's a birth and death together and then i think the background oh. landscape is represented life so it's a life dead and birth oh so that's the mother wolf and yeah it's a mother wolf yeah yeah yes yeah, god and see wow. you can see the how you say it? the nipples nipples okay yes. oh yeah i know that but i don't know is it possible to use on a wolf or yeah, not? So. <laughs> I'm not a wolf expert, but I think okay. so. So this is the painting that I saw and absolutely fell in love with in Zaya's studio. Um, in particular, I was writing about the source. Uh, I was writing about Frida Kahlo, and I didn't expect to see her influence in Ulaanbaatar. I was really shocked and delighted. And this is his painting from the year earlier than I was there, 2018, called Frida Under the Step Sky. But um, Zaya, tell us what this painting is about for you. Well, you know, in the in a, in a Buddhist mythology, we, we believe in the reincarnation. So I believe also is it's possible also painting, artwork can be reincarnated. So I study reincarnation, yeah, oh. re reincarnated. So I like to embrace uh, Frida Kahlo's uh, spirit. I feel like she's so sad. I mean, she's a great painter, but she has a difficult life because of difficult life, misery, pain, all these paintings comes out. But the people just enjoy what he's, her pain. But I want to see things different way. All she wants, maybe she wants to have a baby. She did. She, she did. And then I got four children, and I have also five brothers and sisters. So why maybe I can give one of my son to her? That's why, you know, two Fredas, one Freda become Mongolian Freda. And the Mongolian Freda understand the Mexican Freda and then give it to her son to Mexican Freda which is make her so happy. And uh, that's the story. And uh, you know what, that's what I painted. Um, tell us about the costume the Mongolian Frida wears. Oh yeah, this is the unique thing about, you can see a uh, uh, long time ago, I, oh no, it's 15, 17 years ago, I, I showed in San Francisco my work. And that was mostly Mongolian women, just like that. And then some Americans come and then they ask me, oh, your inspiration is like a Star Wars movie? And then I thought, oh, there's not many people know about Mongolia. I don't know even Star Wars. I never seen that movie, but, but anyway, so the most unique thing about Mongolian women's dress is uh, this uh, decoration of hair. So long time ago, there was a constant battle between the Medic tribes and uh, there's always civil kind of civil war and uh, Genghis Khan's constant invention for other country. And there's many enemy, everybody is enemy each other, but then the woman, children, wife is always victim of the war. So the behind of man, the enemy is always taking revenge from family. The woman wants to protect themselves and 
start to dress like, you know, it's a called hanger. Hanger means like heavenly bird, like look like a dragon, but that bird has a horn. And so this one, uh, how do you say it's a, it's a- Shoulder. Shoulder is uh, that represented her wings. It's a kind of spiritual defense of their family and children. So usually married women dress like that. And the long sleeve? The long sleeve, the long time ago was like, you know, protecting your hand. It looks like uh, gloves. But then uh, 17th, 18th century, the, under the Manchu time, there is a big gap between poor and rich. And then the woman's how much rich, you know, the sleeves getting longer. It's become a fashion. So I heard the most rich woman was carry 40 kilogram heavy dress. Oh my goodness. It's like living bank, you know, oh there was no bank. So woman is a bank. <laughs> All that silver. <laughs> yeah, right? silver, gold, they add, and then it become more heavy elegant. And where did you see Frida Kahlo's two Fridas first see it? To Freda's, I actually, there's a, I watched the movie called Freda. Mm. Then I collect her uh, books and I've, I'm, I'm, I'm actually falling in love with her story. And also it's a painful story. And that's what, yeah. It's, but you are interested in stories about women, whether they're Mongolian or Mexican. Yeah, I, it's everywhere woman is the same. Now, what this is an early painting from your quite early days. What's the story about the old baby? We've seen the Mongolian baby. With the well, Frida. this one is also I hear the stories, and uh, there was a very famous monk uh, living in the Gobi Desert, and his name is uh, Danzang uh, Arabja. Danzang Arabja has a poetry about. Uh, about earth. The earth is, seems to be its old woman. It called Madame Earth. So I called these paintings Madame Earth. So the earth is old, but then humans are her baby. But then that human is way older than her mom. So that's kind of, you know, it's, it's surreal, but it's real. It's, it's, it's to me, it's very interesting. Then I uh, painted it when I was 14 years old. It's called Madame Earth. Is that a Buddhist story? No, it, it is not Buddhist story. It's maybe the monks, her own oh, kind of, uh, kind of a Mongolian poetry, box story. Box story yeah. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, the baby, Benjamin Mui, you know, born is old, but then never grows up. And what's the name of this painting? This painting called uh, Training the Princess. I painted in 2014. One, at that time we live in nearby Tokyo. And uh, one morning I saw they're playing, you know, my uh, oldest daughter, she's very active. She's, she has a energy and that she, She's stubborn. And then mom is trying to teach her how to meditate. And I took the picture. This is the before the pain. Ah. So I make this picture as a reference to make my para. This is like I, I feel I'm first time I'm creating my own gods. That's what I call it's a training the princess. Well, that's very wonderful. I think we could now open up to see if we have some, uh, let's see, how do I get out of here? Um, in the chat, oh, we have lots of them, people in the chat. Um, I, Rita, Edith Ray Brown says to everyone, much we don't know, I agree, interesting and fascinating. I think I've missed, oh, up at the top, I should start. Whoops. Well, I'll just start here. Roz Diamond says, love this image, very iconic. Uh, how refreshing, Peter Mae Brown again. 
to hear these stories, especially in this day and age. What a wonderful artist, Ros Diamond Sweet. Shelley Perry, a dramatic. Despo Magoni, to everyone, love it. Edith Ray Brown almost looks like a woodcut print. Now let me go up to the top. Does anybody want to ask I any questions? Um, Wasn't there a, a Japanese period also in the 1930s, late 20s even? Uh, the period yeah. when, when the Japanese invaded Mongolia? Oh. Yeah, it's 1930s, yeah, 1939, they, they, they tried, but it was a complex story. Uh, when I was at school, our teachers teach, it was Japanese invent, try to invent. Uh -huh. yeah, then Russia come to protect, but then now the history is changed. It's conflict on the border. Probably there is a bunch of drama ahead. It's not really Japanese invention, but definitely there was some kind of war happened. Oh. So it's two to, I think it's unofficially 400 Mongolian soldiers dead. Uh -huh. They accidentally, you know, Russian pilot bumped to Mongolian soldiers oh. and then half of them died and then they oh. hide. Was the Japanese invasion a country? Japanese of, invasion. A free text? Yeah, free text. An that, for the yeah, Russians to yeah. Come in? Yeah, it was like conflict between Russia and China, uh, Russia and uh, Japanese troops in Mongolian border, or either Japanese tried to in Mongolia. I don't think there was a, J Japan was losing the war during that time. There was no extra power to invent another country. Didn't the, didn't the Japanese attempt to uh, make one of the, uh, I don't know, it was a prince of the Mongolian kingdom or of the Mongolian family. Oh, yeah, no, that's a... Into, into a uh, sort of a surrogate for them? No, that's a, that's a Manchu. You okay. know, Japanese, when they make war in China, before that, they don't want to make war under the name of Japan. They mm -hmm. are restoring um, the Manchu king dynasty that's what they're picking up of the, the last empire, emperor Manchu from Manchu and then promise him, we're gonna build his, your empire. And that's what the whole war, you know, they try to make under the different name. So is that more like 1900 around the turn of the century? That's, uh, that's uh, I believe that's in like 19, 30s, I guess. 30s. Oh, that was 1930s. Okay. Yes, it's, it's like right before World War II. Yeah. There's an interesting movie about Last Imperial. It's the name of movies, Last Imperial. Right. China. China. You should watch that movie. The whole thing I understand from that movie. I'm not right. a historian, but. Mm -hmm. 